Well, welcome. This is the old SQL, no SQL, the new SQL, what? <laughs> that was my response last year when I came to the conference, and um, I thought, what is new SQL? And the, the SQL databases that I've been uh, a database architect for for years, they're old now. And am I out of a job? Is this what is going on here? And so um, for the last year, I've been doing research on the NoSQL space. And a little more background, um, my, uh, I've, written, I've written a book and has in a second edition now um, on CSS and HTML. I'm the principal architect at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, I'm in the uh, group that works with enterprise information. So I guess I'm the enterprise information data architect. Um, the LDS Church is a, a very, is a centralized church, so it's not like a little congregation. Um, it's 14 million members all over the world. Um, and so it's a very large multinational group. Um, everything you can imagine in a multinational corporation, we have to deal with. So a very large IT shop, a large bureaucracy that comes with anything big. Um, and so we have a big infrastructure group, multiple data centers, um, and lots of data, and lots of databases. And so my responsibility is to be is the architecture for all the Oracle, SQL Server, and NoSQL databases at the church. Um, for, four years ago, um, almost five years ago now, um, we were looking at one of our architects brought in a product called Mark Logic, and we thought, and and I was uh, at that time, did we just in our team was Oracle and SQL Server. We're pretty much an Oracle shop, and and that's my background um, is Oracle database tuning and engineering, and so. Um, my boss, who's also an Oracle guy, says, um, we hear this MarkLogic thing, I don't know what it is, but kill it. And so, <laughs> and so I said, I just got back from Oracle Open World. And so I said, okay, well, I'll do my job. So we went to town, and my job was to remove all traces of this abomination from our, from our pure Oracle environment. Um, in reality, after two months of trying to get the Oracle XML DB to perform well and never succeeded, I worked with the product manager. Um, we brought in Mark Logic. I finally could see it. Okay, I'll even try this thing. So um, the other, there was another team that was pushing it. They were pushing and trying it. And we just had these wars going back and forth on, on specifications and capabilities. So I finally installed Mark Logic. And literally, two hours later, I get it up and running. And it's doing everything. I just took me two months to get Oracle to do, and Oracle wasn't succeeding. Now, in all fairness, that was. That was almost five years ago. Um, I haven't, we haven't played with Oracle XML DB since because we went with MarkLogic and had great success. Um, there were some internal things happened. A year later, I built the MarkLogic team. We had huge wars internally, continually. Um, now that I was an advocate for this NoSQL thing, um, and everyone else was, was now against me, it was really interesting for a year to fight these battles. But it, I mean, eventually it was very successful. Um, we now have over 50 applications for in MarkLogic. All of our major websites are delivered using MarkLogic. Uh, so it's been a great success story. And we just uh, actually made a long-term commitment to MarkLogic with a perpetual enterprise license. So as you can tell, uh, my background is, is kind of a conversion story to MarkLogic. But the other side of the story is um, there were some politics about three years ago. And um, the team that ended up owning MarkLogic was not my team. And so I moved off and, and went back to enterprise database architecture. And MarkLogic wasn't in my group. And so for, for three years, I didn't really do anything with MarkLogic. Um, and so last year, we have a whole group of architects, and they wanted to do research NoSQL. And so they, um, they, we all got together and started researching all the different vendors, all the major vendors. There's about seven of them that we looked into. Spent a whole year doing it. Um, ironically, the whole time, and this is kind of sad because I have all my MarkLogic friends here, the whole time I wasn't even thinking of MarkLogic as NoSQL. And that's bizarre because it is. I was thinking of MarkLogic as a data warehouse for XML documents and for website content delivery. And the use cases we were thinking for NoSQL were very different. And so I didn't even consider MarkLogic as an option. And we looked at all the other vendors who brought them in. We did extensive analysis, um, capability analysis. I can't share all that with you because we signed non disclosure agreements. But um, in the end, I'll show you the conclusions we came to. So if I'm after all this is over with, it hit me, wait a minute, we have a NoSQL already, and it's called MarkLogic. <laughs> and I kind of like that technology. Why am I not even thinking about it? It was really strange. In fact, McCreary earlier in, in um, yesterday was talking about how come MarkLogic's not even in the 
you know, and mindset of, of people who think NoSQL. And I think it's, and I'll explain that later in the presentation, but it really wasn't. And that was really bizarre. So I kind of almost had another conversion story. So we started debating should Mark Logic, since we already have it, be our NoSQL of choice in the enterprise? How does it compare with all the other NoSQL vendors? So we did that detailed analysis. And the result was we went to management and we said, um, Mark Logic outshines the others in every category, um, but with a few minor details. And um, there's no question. And so we actually, have, we actually decided to go strategic with Mark Logic for not only XML and document delivery, but all NoSQL. And so this presentation um, will give you the results of my year's worth of research. Um, and just so you know, it sounds like I'm a real Mark Logic advocate, and I am a fan of Mark Logic. I just want you to know I've had several conversion stories along the way back and forth. Um, and when I did this research, I actually wasn't even thinking of Mark Logic. So it really wasn't a biased research. Um, so the agenda is we're going to talk about what are the different kinds of SQL, no SQL, new SQL, the new data paradigms, new hardware paradigms, and the real question is, does the enterprise need no SQL? We um, you know the internet startups love no SQL, and most of, most of the groups last year that were at this conference were internet startup folks. There are a few enterprise folks. So the question is, is it ready for the enterprise? And, um, and which ones are ready, if any? So here's the, the, the slide that I think summarizes my whole research. Um, I want to walk over here to, to point things out. I have two dimensions. One is the hardware dimension. You have low latency, fast, online transaction application. Um, and it's all about velocity in this upper quadrant. The bottom one is all about high bandwidth, analytical. And, there's, and I will explain later in the presentation why that is so important, because there's physical reasons why you have to optimize this way. And so databases automatically choose um, whether they intend to or not, one of these optimizations. On the bottom, horizontally, you have five different major paradigms, and then raw, which is not a paradigm. It's just give us whatever you got in whatever data format you have, and let's see what we can do with it. So we're talking about these different paradigms against the harbor realities, and that's the space of NoSQL. And it breaks down into, you've got graph databases um, that are really optimized for RAM and very quick um, online transaction processing. And, and the key thing to think of there is you have high velocity, but you're also retrieving small amounts of data. You're not, say, querying the entire database, summarize it, aggregate it, give me the results. You're saying, give me a few documents that match my criteria. That's what this top area is all about. And that's true for the document databases. Um, these aren't all of them, but these are uh, the selection that I feel like that are currently the top dogs in the, in the market, but that's always changing. Um, column key value stores. The, I group these together because really the um, columnar databases, which are very different by the way than a columnar data warehouse. And those of you who are familiar with data warehousing realize that there is a whole technology group called columnar data warehousing. And that's where you have um, instead of rows and columns, you have columns of rows and you compress all your columns. And that's a really hot technology in the data warehouse world. Well, this columnar NoSQL is all about really multiple multi dimensional keys. You have a key, and then you have a time dimension, which is just a segment of your key. And then you have a column family, which is a segment of your key. So you just have multiple dimensional keys, and that allows you to, to hierarchically dig down into your, doc, your documents more easily. But really, all Cassandra is, and React are just an H-based hybrid cable with sparsely populated multiple dimension key value stores. Um, and then you have new SQL, which was really shocked to me last conference, was VoltDB and some other ones like ClusterX. And then, then I remembered, well, wait, that's not new. Oracle Times 10 database and a lot of other in-memory databases have been around for a long time. That is not a new technology. Um, and so, but it is an optimization, and that's the important point. It's an optimization to store your data in RAM for high velocity and low latency operational data storage. And then the, another one that came out, Oracle announced Exolytics at the same time as the conference last year. Exolytics is um, basically analytics in an in-memory database. So as you have your data streaming in very rapidly, it's streaming through your in-memory database, and then you pick off what you care about and do analysis on it in real time so that you can aggregate, summarize, and deliver. Um, and that's yet another optimization using a dimensional model. Down here, we have other optimizations. At this same time last year, we were doing research to see if should we buy um, a new kind of data warehouse. Our current data warehouse, which is an Oracle data warehouse, wasn't performing very well. 
Um, and so we wanted to see what's better. So we researched all the major vendors. Um, the ones listed here we included in our research. We had proof of concepts. We eventually ended up going with exit data because we're Oracle shop and it, we didn't have the conversion costs um, were significant to anyone else. So that was mainly just a conversion cost issue. But we learned that Oracle and the, and the marketplace is now changing the way they do things. They're optimizing for appliances. So the future of all databases are really going to be appliances because we found that trying to optimize, like I said, my background is performance tuning in Oracle, um, trying to tune all the layers from your physical servers and your operating system, the network, the storage, and getting it all to work with all the different teams in a large infrastructure group is near impossible because everyone has different agendas and different needs. And so vendors are now saying, we, we know how to tune everything to work for our product the best. And so we're going to sell you an appliance that is pre-tuned and pre-built to make that work. And so we purchased Exadata, and it's true. Exadata lived up to everything we promised um, because they were able to tune their or software to work on the hardware in just the right way. And then there's a lot more than just hardware here. There's a ton of software optimization for massively parallel processing that, that fits into this model of analytical volume and bandwidth. Um, now here's your SQL databases. They're kind of in the middle of the road, right? They're not, they're a little, they, they're not as high velocity as they are high volume, I would say. So I put them a little bit lower, but they are kind of multi-purpose. And then you've got your object-oriented databases, which have never really, um, they've been around forever, but they haven't ever really taken off as a, as a, as a technology. Um, and they're very similar to SQL. They're just more specialized for getting rid of the impedance mismatch between objects in your Java and .NET and your database. And that's a real big, that's a big deal. Um, but for some reason, they never taken off. And I think I know the answer to why they have it, and we'll talk about it later. Then you have a document warehouse, and a lot of Mark Logic down here. That's a, that's a strange place in some people's minds where to put Mark Logic, because Mark Logic is more, was designed originally to be a warehouse for XML documents that were published. And it's originally optimized for that. It wasn't optimized for high velocity. Um, but you can optimize Mark Logic for high velocity. And they're just starting to do that. But it, by default, it's not. If, if you do performance testing on it out of the box, it's not going to give you the high velocity that you would get from a Mongo unless you really use some customization and special code. Well, that's actually what Mongo does, it's customization and special code. So it's trivial for Mark Logic to get there. But right now, their whole architecture is really strong right here. And I think that's the main reason why you don't see them lumped with Mongo and, and uh, Couch and all those others that are high velocity, because that's what they focus on, not being a data warehouse. And then you have your Hadoop over here, which you just load anything you want into it, raw data, run Java programs to extract whatever you want out of it, reduce that down, and deliver it to a warehouse. So this is, this is the end result of my analysis of what, what is NoSQL, NewSQL, and OldSQL. And then we can talk about um, what does all this mean and how, why do we care? So here's the data flow that would happen if you would actually apply all this. Now this is a little scary. I showed this to my boss and he freaked out. He actually literally freaked out. He goes, you mean we're going to have this nasty architecture in our enterprise? I mean, it was bad enough when we had originally just you know, an app going to SQL, going down to a data warehouse. You know, that's two moving parts. And now we brought in Mark Logic, we got this document warehouse, and we have document management systems that publish to it, plus web apps that publish to it. And, now we, and then it has to get data over here in the warehouse. Um, and until the latest release, that was very hard to do. Um, but now the new release, Mark Logic actually supports SQL. And so that's a huge win for us. So now we can get data out of Mark Logic into a data warehouse because it's a standard communication protocol. Um, but then we're going to say we're bringing, we have MapReduce now. We have Hadoop in our enterprise. Um, it's still some corner cases. But now we brought that in. And it usually does all the large, massively quick um, reductions of data so we can get it into a warehouse. And then we had several teams that actually built, used graph databases and, and document databases, some Mongo, some, some Reoc, and um, some Neo4j. And so all of a sudden we had all of this. And how do you integrate that? I mean, my job is data integration. How are you going to manage all of these different kinds of data and different data systems? How are you going to the cost? Think about the infrastructure cost of how you support all these different servers. Um, we have hundreds and hundreds actually thousands of servers. Um, and how do you manage all this different complexity? It adds a whole new level of complexity to our team. And so he freaked out and he says, we can't do this. We need, we need one vendor to rule them all. <laughs> we can't have all these vendors. Um, 
But right now, there isn't one solution. The output data flow is not much better. You have to write queries in all these different languages. You have to know X query, you have to know SQL, you have to know proprietary languages like MongoDB. Or in fact, every NoSQL vendor has a proprietary language that you use to interface with their product. And you have to learn all these different um, techniques to get data out of the system. And that's a lot of query, that's a lot of development work. So this, I know the earlier, in the earlier session they talked about, you, know, you choose the architecture that makes the most sense for you. Um, but when you start doing that, there's a long-term technical debt that you incur. The more vendors, the more technologies, the more, the more your applications use multiple technologies, the more in debt you are to all the system. And it's harder just to update your system, to maintain it. And your availability decreases. The more servers I have to go to, to get a page rendered, my overall availability declines. Because you multiply the availability of each type of server you're going to, or each server you're going to, against each other. So if one is 95%, the best I could be on the is 95%, but you multiply that against your 98% and your you know, 90, 99%, it drags everything down. So you have to think about all these things when you create a complex architecture. And complexity breeds instability and failures, software failures, because different pieces don't work and bugs in your code. So this is not a trivial thing to embrace for the enterprise that cares about low cost delivering applications. Embracing this complex NoSQL world is a scary thing. But it's a cool thing because with the graph database, I can do things I can't do otherwise. The same thing with the document database. And new SQL gives me that flow of real uh, flexible queries. And then regular traditional database, which is lower cost. And then you've got warehouse. So each of these things gives you um, different capabilities. So how do you manage all this? That's what I'm going to talk about today. So there's new data paradigms. I've touched on this several times. One of my favorite books is um, by, by Thomas S. Kuhn. We talked about the structure of scientific revolutions. And when you have a paradigm, everyone holds on very strong to the old paradigm. Like my boss holding on to Oracle saying, you can't, get, can't let this mark logic abomination in here. That was a that mark logic and no sequels, a new paradigm. Graph databases, document databases, new paradigms. <laughs> they truly are legitimate paradigms. And um, it's hard for the establishment to accept new paradigms. Until, as Thomas Kuhn points out, that the dissonance between the old and the new becomes so great that the new can do things that the old can't do, and the new has proven it, that, this, that the distance between the two is so great that the, the, the old, there's a little a revolution happens, and revolutions can be bloody, uh, hopefully not literally, but intellectually bloody, right? And then you can transfer over to the technology. So what's wrong with our SQL databases? I found this picture on the internet, I just loved it. It's, um, it's, open, it's, open, it's an open source domain picture. Um, I think uh, there's three things. We'll, and you'll, see, you'll hear about variability and variety a lot, right? You've heard it tons. But you haven't heard a lot about relevance. And that's one of the weaknesses of most NoSQL solutions is that they don't leverage um, document relevance. If you have a document database and you're not, real, you're not leveraging that, you're missing the boat. And most of the NoSQL solutions that are document-oriented are. Redox does have a seed and they're trying to get into um, search and, and that would help. But, they're not anywhere near like MarkLogic. MarkLogic is, that's what they built their whole system on, relevance. How can you find the data you're interested in? That's what relevance is all about. So really, to me, that's, that's not what SQL databases are good at. You can use context index in Oracle, and I know that, very, that technology very well, um, but it's very cumbersome. It doesn't work anywhere near as well as MarkLogic does. Not anywhere close. Um, so, and you have to, in order to get relevance out of a SQL database, you have to take everything you care about Turn it into an XML document, store the XML document in the context index. So you're really merging both technologies, a document database inside of a relational database, and using triggers, basically, to ensure that your XML documents are kept up with your relational data. So variability, we're talking about rapid change, and um, schemas and schemaless development. So I'm going to move very quickly through these. Um, variety, you're talking about all kinds of data in all of those various forms. And that means new data structures, paradigms, new data types, and different market standards. So relevance is also about taking a, a, a narrative, a story, a document, and you add data to it. And what we're doing is we're, we're discovering in the document what the data is. Then we discover the semantic relationships between the data. That's already a graph database. And um, then you discover the structural relationships. That's your document hierarchy. And then all together, it gives you contextual information. If you think about a SQL database, we just shred all that stuff out into a schema. And we define what we're interested in, maybe you know, those L's and O's and A's, the different types of data, like T's and topics. 
You may be on the topic, so I'll just shred this data into a topic schema. You know, but if that's all you care about, that may be fine, but there's stuff you don't know about. And how do those topics fit into the overall context? All that is lost in a relational database. But in a document database, it's all there. And so you can keep discovering. Oh, I discovered I'm much more interested in places and people. And let's add those to it. You know, and then there, and you can discover more relationships between the data. There's this infinite number of relationships implied in this document. And every one of us in this room would actually probably see different relationships that others in the room don't see. And so over time, people will add relationships. And you can't build that into a relational database. It's impossible. It's, it's infinite number of possibilities. That's where a semantic graph database is very powerful. Um, and then your document structure. If you, want to, if you want better search results, you need to have, well, I want to search within my headings because they're more important than the body text. They're going to give me more relevance, better meaning to the end user. I want to search annotations. I'm going to search, I'm going to search um, the, all the headings. I'm going to search you know, whatever I care about. I'm going to, I'm going to search people. I'm just going to search people. And I'm going to rank all these different types of things in my search results so that it sorts. So that's, that's one thing that Mark Watson does that other products like autonomy and other search engines don't do. It's allow you to search within a context, and the context is structured. The weakness of work logic, though, is it doesn't yet do a good job of semantic graph um, searches. And that's, the, and that's critical for its future as a technology. Um, and they need to do that. By the way, only graph databases today, and, and typically the semantic versions, which aren't in this conference. Because um, you'll hear a graph database and semantic databases, and those two groups are warning against each other. Graphs are NoSQL, semantic are more document, ontology-oriented, experts, OWL, and so web kind of technologies. And those two groups are talking and working with each other, and, they, and they're I mean, really the same kind of thing, they just have a different focus. And so the, the document-centric ones are doing this kind of thing, and that's, that's a place that will make, if we can merge that into our NoSQL solutions, we'll have better NoSQL solutions. So what is SQL good at? Well, it's really good at the relational model, and that's very important. That's not a bad thing. Um, EF Cod proved that um, 50 years ago. Um, and then we have the initial model, which we put in our warehouses. And then we have an object model, which our Java and .NET apps and other object-oriented languages use, which is very different. And it's not a, and it's not a persistent model, by the way. And I, we'll talk about that when I get to that. And then the document model, we've been talking about with, with Mark Logic and Mongo and, and um, React. Um, not, not React. Mongo and um, Couch. And then we have the graph model. So I'm going to talk about each one of these real briefly. So the relational model, this focuses on the data. And you have relations, ironically it's called relational, but it's the, the, the relations are not the focus. <laughs> right? You're focused on how can I take data and put it together into a, into a set of data, a table, right? And then I got to connect it if I have this to something else. And I do. I, can, I shred it out so I can connect it to a few things. Um, but I'm really focused on the data. And, and really, it was back. This, these were invented in the days when we were interested in data processing apps. If you remember that term was real popular. You don't, you don't hear that anymore because object oriented programming has changed the term to, uh, or, uh, sorry, data entry apps. Now, I can't even say it right. It used to be data entry apps because we're entering data into our data systems. Now it's data processing apps because we enter data into processing applications and the database is a cycle. Um, I'll talk more about that in a second. So this focuses on data and it, and notice it's not really good at variability, variety, or relevance. The relational model but is really good at flexibility in querying operational data. You want to see your data in any way you can imagine because, you, because the modeler will take the data and shred it into flexible structures. You can create ways you didn't anticipate when you started. But there's no upfront cost. It takes a lot of design, a lot of thinking, a lot of gen generic thinking um, to make that happen. Dimensional modeling is not on data, it's on information. I take that data that's in a relational database, I restructure it into a star schema, and now it's information. I've taken, because the, the data that I care about are the facts. The facts are in a fact table, like in the previous model we were doing about drugs and, and given during surgery. And here I'm interested in drug doses, and now I can query it by any of these dimensions that are surrounding it. I can say, give me all the drug the drug administrations that were given in this hospital at this time by this kind of surgeon, you know, and at this dosage. You know, and you can do it very easily because the structure is a dimensional model. So a dimensional model takes a relational shredded thing, uh, which is very hard to query, uh, very flexible, but it, it makes it into a less flexible beast. That's not flexible. I can't do anything but query drug doses. But it's very easy to query it in any way you can imagine. 
And because it's so easy, end users can query very quickly and get the data that they need. Because data is, it's a really a dimensional model like putting data in a context. So that's why it has good relevance. And users use data warehouses to get relevant data and the data they want. Um, it's got a decent variety because you can extract data from about anything. The problem is you've got to write code to do it, and that code's brittle. If the source changes, your state breaks. And, we, and we're charged with, I'm also the architect for our BI team, and, and our, we have like 45, 40, it keeps growing, I think it's 40 BI engineers now writing data warehouse stuff. And, um, and we have detailed, hundreds of detailed jobs. And if the source system changes anything, it breaks our job. And you can imagine a large enterprise, they don't talk to you. They just change their system. <laughs> and it breaks. And you go, what bro? But they can even just change data, not even the structure, right? And break your details. Because there's assumptions. So it is brittle. That's why it's not great on variety. And it's and, and, and very brittle. But it's great for transforming authoritative data into contextual information so you get good relevance. And now you can do self-service and ad hoc reporting. The object model is, like I said, it's not persistent. It's really what object-oriented languages are based on. But remember, C++ is the founding object-oriented language. Didn't even have persistence at all in the language, right? C didn't have persistence in the library that you added. Persistence was never a thought in, in any of the major object-oriented languages. C sharp, Java, you name them. Um, that's an afterthought. Oh, we'll go to a database for that. Well, so that creates uh, a different paradigm. A database is a relational paradigm, and an object-oriented language is a completely different paradigm. That object relational mismatch is huge, makes development so expensive. Well, object-oriented programming is all about process. It's about creating, taking data and encapsulating it inside of an object and hiding the data. And they literally call it information hiding. Um, notice the database is the opposite. The database exposes your data so you can query it flexibly. Well, object-oriented hides it. What do they hide behind? Methods. What are methods? Processes. And then I can inherit processes. I can group processes. So object oriented program is really good about managing process. You know, what can I do to my data? And managing that complexity of what I do. This is where the object or, um, the database leaders missed the boat. They, um, there was this object, you know, the object oriented databases started to come in so that it was less than Peter Smith's map. And so they, the major vendors said, okay, we'll do object relational mapping. This is great. And we'll do, and we'll also build object features into our relational databases. Well, they forgot what object oriented programming is. It's about the methods. It's not about these minor object relational object stuff that they stick in there that no one uses today. Oh, in our hundreds of databases, we don't use it at all. Um, it's about encapsulating the data inside of methods and managing methods. And the database vendors did nothing to encapsulate data in databases with methods. The, for example, the language in Oracle is PLC. It stands for procedural language. That's not object oriented. And they made no efforts to make it object oriented. So that, and none of those, I mean, Microsoft's language, T SQL, transaction SQL, is procedural. It's not object oriented. So they missed the whole boat on, on bringing the object oriented paradigm into the database. <coughs> and so because of that, we have this problem of relational mismatch, and, and that's a disaster. Um, so object model is really good at managing processes so we can speed and simplify our development. The document model is a nice compromise between object oriented and relational. It brings it all together, and I really like this model. And it's a, and it's a it doesn't replace relational. That's an important point. It's complementary. It's different. Um, so the document model talks about putting uh, objects inside of a context, just like dimensional. But in this case, the, the dimensional model is very restricted on the context you put it in. The dimensional model says you have facts surrounded by dimensions. And, uh, but an object, a document model, you can have any kind of structure you want inside your document. Anything. As complex as you want. Well, in the real world, object-oriented programming languages allow you to really complex structures. And link lists with, with a lookup list, B trees, and then you can have any kind, you know, any kind of connection between any structure. You're, you're, it's just incredibly complex. And I built, I've been develop, a developer for 20 years, and I built very sophisticated object-oriented models. I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible because they, they tend to explode in complexity and then performance tanks. But you still have lots of flexibility and power. A document, you can take whatever complexity you have in an object model and stick it in your document. And object-oriented models do need to save their, their, their objects in a point in time, because they have to persist them at a point in time. And what you do, you wrap it into a document, which is your point in time, and you save it. 
And so um, it turns out Mark Logic does this too, but they came from the opposite perspective. They took documents that are published by people, you know, XML books and magazines and whatever, and then they publish them into a warehouse. They are documents. It turns out they're really the same thing. The difference is a program is generating your document, which is more complex. Well, documents are very complex market too, but they're very complex beasts. They're just from different angles. So I think that's why Mark Logic's not been successful in the civil world so far, because they say, well, we're all about document publishing. You know, human generated magazine articles and stuff that we want to deliver out to the web. And those people say, no, we're about programs that have object oriented programming. We want to save and persist our data. Two different approaches. One is, and Mark Lodge is more analytical, and this is, and this, those sequel is more transactional. But there is no difference, really, in the, the document. And then Mark Lodge realized this, and now that the JSON is a native data structure in Mark Lodge, which makes it very easy for Java programs and JavaScript programs to persist their Java objects, because JSON is JavaScript object notation, right? So this is an object notation that you persist that in your Mark Lodge database. So Mark Lodge has truly made the, the jump from being an uh, XML document database into a NoSQL database with those changes. So XML versus JSON, they're very similar, they're almost identical. XML is more complicated than JSON. XML allows text to be freely distributed among your content. So here is, um, here's the word D. It has no object wrapped around it, no element wrapped around it. It's just floating there. And other elements are free floating in there. In JSON, that word D cannot disclose. It has to be part of an object. And that's the primary functional difference, but also there's things like you have to have namespaces in XML, which complicates the language tremendously. It makes, makes X a real pain to use. Um, you have to have precisely typed, but, but, but the other not you have to be. XML does not have to be precisely typed, but it can be. Whereas JSON has no standard for precision typing. So date types are undefined, so it's your app. And that's not good for data integration at all. So that's the strength of XML. Um, but XML is harder to read and parse. It's more, it has more overhead. JSON is very easy and simple. Um, and so JSON is replacing XML as a data interchange language across the enterprise, in my opinion, anyway. Um, so the document model is really good to enable search relevance because you can compare what's in a document to what's in every other document. It's really an us versus them comparison. But you have to have a container to do the comparison. That's why an object-oriented database doesn't work. They don't have containers. Your objects are just objects that you persisted. They're not wrapped in a container, so you can't say, compare this set of objects to that set of objects without running a query and then comparing the queries. And so that's why you can't get search relevance very easily out of an object oriented database, but it's very easy to get it out of a document oriented database. You just say, what's in this one? Compare to those, and is it more relevant to me? And then the last one is the graph model. We're managing relationships. Relationships are the focus now. And so it inverts everything in a relational database. Data was the focus, and in a graph database, we care about the types of relationships, and we actually define types of relationships. The data is not the point. In fact, I would have, if I were in a graph database, I would just be some ID. What identifies me are all the relationships of everything about me. It's the relationships that define me, not my data point. That's the exact opposite of relational programming, where I say, here's a, Mike Bauer, here's a table, and here's everything I want to know about Mike Bowers in this table, or a couple of tables. I normalize it. In, in, in a graph database, I'm just a number, and then I have properties, you know, brown hair, blue green eyes, you know, five eight, whatever. All those things start to define who I am, and there's an infinite number of, pro of relationships I can add to me. And the relationships are typed. Those in a, in a relational database, there's no typing relationships. And your modeling might document it as metadata, but it's never used. The relationships just say this column is related to that column. In a relational database, in a graph database, you say, no, this relationship has a type. This is hair color type. And it has a, it has a data type and, a data, and metadata about the relationship. So I can say, when I assign a hair color type to a person and it's brown, that tells me something about the person. So relationships are the critical thing. That's huge. I think this is definitely graph models of the future. But the problem is, you're dealing with data at an atomic level. You know, you're dealing with, it, it's, I mean, at least a relational database is a hybrid. You can get, you get your mind record at a table. It's easy to look at the data in the table and figure out what it means. In a graph database, I have a number. Now, what does it mean? Well, I've got a bunch of other numbers that have types. What are those? Oh, yeah, that's brown color. I mean, to figure this out, there's so much indirection. It, it blows your mind. How do you manage that? So we, we have a lot of tools that have, to come, that have to be developed to make graph databases easier to manage. 
but it's great for enhancing text search. You can't, I, this is a really strong statement, but I really believe this. You, search relevance is okay in a document database by itself. The things I was talking about before about what's in this document versus what's in others, but if you want real good search relevance, you have to have a graph database or graph database techniques in your document database. Um, the Google right now is proof of that. They're doing that. They purchased a graph database vendor. If you go to the website, you search person and Google, it gives you a whole list of things on the side um, about that person that comes from a graph database. Uh, actually, a semantic database. So semantics are the future of search relevance, but that's beyond the scope of this discussion, but I think it's very important. Um, so here's the model takeaways. We've got five different documents, uh, five different models, and each paradigm is very important. And, and they're all going to be around for a very long time. These are paradigms. These are not technologies. Okay, so that's how come we have those paradigms at the bottom and how all of those SQL um, systems fit into the five paradigms. Now, we'll talk about hardware paradigms. I'm going to go very quickly through this. We've got velocity and volume. Um, do we need to optimize differently? You bet. The difference is cost. Um, RAM is more expensive than disk. That's the bottom line of this. But if you look at this chart on the bottom right, I do the cost for each of these technologies, flash, RAM, and, and hard disk, based on their cost per storage volume, gigabytes, versus the, the bandwidth of getting to it, the IOPS they can do, and also their latency. And, and when you do a full analysis of all these costs, it turns out that you have to optimize. If you want to go for big volume, you, you, have to, you can't afford to do it in RAM. It just doesn't work. I tried real hard to figure out ways that it just, the, it, the economic model does not work. Maybe 10 years from now it'll be different, but today it's forcing decisions we make. And so in this, what happens is we don't velocity optimize on the top. We're going to stick our stuff in RAM, and it's going to be about small data in RAM. Um, but we're going to use RAM as a big throughput mechanism to get our data onto disk. But when it's on disk, we're not going to touch it very much. We're going to keep the data, our working set, in RAM. And, and, and if you have to go to disk, we'll just go little pieces at a time and just keep it in RAM and, and take stuff out of RAM. Basically, it's a big cache. Um, so the idea is transactions, little stuff going in and out of a big RAM cache. And that's why so no SQL system evolved from mem cache D, right? Because it's a big caching system. On the bottom, though, a warehouse is the exact opposite. I've got all my data on disk to begin with. I've got to process much of it or most of it to get an answer. I've got to crunch through and aggregate stuff. I have to go through all of it. So I'm going to optimize my technology very differently for that. And so that's why we see the vendors building appliances, and the appliances are specialized. Like, for example, Oracle built Exolytics optimized for RAM for in-memory real-time analysis, and then exit data for the bottom part to do warehousing. So here's, here's the problem with regular SQL databases, old SQL, is that they're serialized. And the serialization is killing them. So you've got um, this was from Michael Stonebreaker the last time. Um, you've got four ways that databases serialize their stuff and it kills performance. And you may end up being 4% of uh, real processing. And this is really true. I, like I said, Oracle performance, took performance is one of my expertises. And I'll go in there and look and I'll say, you, we're just serializing so much stuff that the CPU's not even running and yet I don't, can't get into the database. Why is that? It drives you nuts. And then you go, well, is it, is it one of these four things? Which of these four things? Tom Kite, who's an Oracle guru, went and wrote a book on called Oracle Database by Design. And the whole point was, you write your queries to get rid of latches. Latches are in-memory locks. In-memory locks. That kills Oracle performance, is, is locking in the memory. Why is that? Because cost of synchronization in memory is huge. A single thread can return in 300 nanoseconds on a, on a simple like, calculation. But if you, you start doing locks, Look at the bottom one, 224,000 nanoseconds because we've done two threads with a single lock. Just doing a lock on two threads, from, from two threads on a, a, a mutex on one piece of data will, will be a thousand times slower performance. And that's what Oracle does in their in-memory cache. You think, well, it's cache, it's faster when we're locking on it, so it's not. So that's where like NoSQL comes in. They say, no, we're not gonna have any locks at all. That's the, one of the secret sauces behind um, VoltDB. Um, and because they, they force you to use store procedures for everything, they force you to basically pump it. It's by design, don't do things with blocks. And they force you by design not to do them, and therefore they're fast. Um, so here's, I can't go through this, but they, here's the two paradigms, the old vertical and the new horizontal. And so the new paradigm for NoSQL, hardware paradigm, is your asynchronous, massively parallel, high-performance computing paradigm. Um, so why would you change the database architecture? Because doesn't Moore's Law make everything faster all the time? Well, it used to. 
But 10 years ago, things changed because we had we have Moore's law creating exponential growth in transistors. But our clock speed flattened out because heat and, and the cost stopped us. Then our power, what well, the cost, power cost, side side was just heat. And then we have side IOP and structure level growth flattened out. That gap between um, exponential growth of transistors and a flattening out of everything else forces us to go to multiple cores. Now, multiple cores, you think, well, it's in the same process, so therefore you're good. No, it's not. I've got multiple cores sharing the same RAM. What does that mean? Locks. Locks kill you. Um, so, velocity and volume, future architecture is going to have to be massive kernel and asynchronous. We're going to have to work on RAM for velocity and disk volume and a massive pair of functional programming languages like XQuery. Um, remember, SQL is not only not object oriented, SQL is not functional. And functional is the future, but I don't have time to go into that. Um, so here's my new paradigm. That's why I wrote turn into high velocity RAM based, low latency systems on the top, and analytical systems on the bottom. So what's wrong with NoSQL? Well, um, the developer gets to do everything in NoSQL. It kind of punted. Um, they said, well, we can't handle concurrency, so it's your deal. We can't handle asset transactions, so it's your deal. And um, I'm, I'm being facetious. Some are, some are more so that way, and some are less so that way. Um, but it, it, that's a huge deal. And I'm going to go briefly through um, cap, the CAP theorem, which explains why they want to do this, and then the problems of doing this. So there's the consistency, availability, and partitioning. I like the P stand for more than partitioning, though. I think it has to do with parallelization and performance. So here's the CAP theorem in a nutshell. We have scalability issues, right? Today we, scale, we used to scale vertically, now we're scaling horizontally all the way to multiple data center scaling, right? We're scaling within a CPU to cores, we're going to multiple CPUs, multiple servers within a data center, and then multiple data centers. Every time we scale out, we're creating um, communication lack of performance, right? A ma order of magnitude slower communication. And that creates more opportunities for partitioning to occur, which means I can't talk to you. I can't talk to that thread. I can't talk to that server. I can't talk to that data center. Um, so that creates availability problems. And then the other thing is, the more I get away from a single core, I'm having consistency problems because I have to synchronize my data across multiple running processes. And the further I get away at like multiple data centers, the bigger the consistency problem becomes. So my availability and my consistency scale out different directions. My consistency, um, and because of that, we have to make choices. So SQL used to be sitting back there on one CPU. It was designed for one CPU. It scaled great. As long as CPUs got faster, Oracle SQL Server scaled beautifully. But now we have to deal with multiple cores and multiple CPUs, multiple servers. That is creating more and more problems for the databases to scale. And they're going to appliances to solve that problem. Um, but NoSQL says, we don't want to scale vertically anymore. Instead, we want to scale horizontally by design. And so NoSQL has to start making choices between consistency and availability. Because the more you scale horizontally, the more you have to trade off. Between am I have consistent data that's synchronized and right up to date. Like for example, I have data in two different data centers. I got to keep it up to date consistently. I got to wait. I have to commit to both before I can say it's there consistently. If I do a two-phase commit across two data centers, the latency is going to kill my performance. I have to wait for two different servers, two different data centers to come back and say yes, I committed across two different network latencies. This kills you. Um, so if you want high performance, then you're going to say, well, I can't have consistency, so I want to have high performance, high availability. So I'll just make it asynchronous. And so. The CAP theorem really is all about going asynchronous to have high availability and high transactions, or synchronous to get consistency. If you have consynchronous, synchronous is a synonym for serialization. And serialization kills high performance and um, kills availability. So that's why you have this trade-off. Um, so as communication becomes less performant and less reliable, we have to compromise and innovate our consistency and availability. So that's where NoSQL is innovating. Um, so we have these trade-offs. But NoSQL says, we'll do it by the transaction. I'll let the developer decide what we want to do. And the developer can say, I want this transaction to be consistent. I want this one to be available. And the developer can do all the work. Um, but the, also, most NoSQL systems don't provide acid transactions. People forget that RDBMS stands for Relational Database Management System. They forget what the M is. We're not, as M is not administrators, DBA is easily managing the system. N is managing concurrent transactions. It's ACID. It's the ACID paradigm. ACID is a paradigm. It's a consistency model. The C in ACID is actually redundant. I mean, consistent really is the byproduct of atomic isolated durable. 
I don't have time to go into the presentation, but they're on the slides. It goes through great detail. Developers have to do a ton of work to compensate for the lack of ACID compliance. And, and, and so some NoSQLs, like MarkLogic, is ACID compliant. Oracle NoSQL is ACID compliant. Um, but others, that, like Mongo, and Cassandra, and React, are not. And this is a big deal. It's a bigger deal than you think. We're so spoiled by our relational databases and managing our consistency model for us. We forget what that means. I just want to say in a nutshell, if you've ever written multi-threaded programs, imagine now writing um, with, with a NoSQL system, millions of users, or uh, thousands of concurrent users, I should say, um, coming into your system, concurrently changing data and managing the consistency of that. Not trivial at all to develop. And, and developers can completely underestimate the cost of that. Um, and so that's something you have to think about. For enterprise applications, if you're not asset compliant, you're not going to save money writing that NoSQL app. You'll save money in the beginning because it's faster, there's no immediate switch match. In the end, you'll be finding concurrency bugs like crazy in your data, and you'll, you'll go crazy. Just like writing multi threaded programs, it's not easy. So I'm going to jump to these things. Um, so if you, the trade-offs are this. If you want higher performance and higher availability, then use, use, get rid of the asset model because it limits those things. But if you want less data loss, you want more query accuracy, less deadlocks, and you want more data integrity and less code to compensate for a lack of those things, then you want an asset compliant NoSQL solution. Or ideally, you want a system that the developer can choose and can say, for this transaction, I, I don't want it to be asset compliant. You know, and that is, that's one of the secret sauces of NoSQL that Mark Logic had yet to do, by the way. Um, Mark Logic's always asset compliant. So that would, be, that would be one thing if they want to get super high velocity and, and volume, something they would consider is allowing you to tune that. Um, so is it enterprise ready for NoSQL today? Well, um, these are nine questions we asked, and here's the nine answers. We did a year-long study of seven vendors, um, and yes, we need a document model. I've talked all about these things already. Um, yes, we need better search relevance, because relation databases don't do a good job of that. Um, Sparkle, by the way, for graph databases, is a very important language that the graph databases don't implement. Um, but the semantic ones, which are really graph databases, they do. So that's kind of a big difference. If you're semantic, you do Sparkle and OWL and ontologies. And if you're graph, you just focus on just um, Java integration. Do you need global availability? No. Not that we don't need it, but we don't need NoSQL for it because we've had global availability in relational databases for decades. We've had multi-master systems for decades. The problem is they don't work. People don't use them because there's problems with them. And NoSQL is no different. It does, it's not a magic thing. They just say to the developer, you have to handle it. And do we need to handle volume? Well, yeah, for less structured big data, we do. We need for some volume. So Hadoop is great for batch processing, and MarkLogic is great for ad hoc querying. And it's this great strength. So MarkLogic has a great big data solution for ad hoc discovery, interactive discovery. Hadoop you program back in MapReduce jobs. It's not as ad hoc. You have to figure out what you want to do, Program it and deliver it. Um, in Mark Logic, it's literally X query. You can just ad hoc. What is this? Let me just try this. You know, and ad hoc query. Um, and it's iterative. It's a different approach. Do we need for velocity? Sometimes we ran analysis, and we just really could not find good use cases in the enterprise for high velocity in, in our particular use case. I think enterprise some do. If you have stock transactions, that's high velocity. You know, there's some definitely some cases for high velocity in the enterprise. But I think most enterprises have less of a need for high velocity than you do. And then um, does the relational, now this is the key. Everybody thought, every, all the architects argued with me all the time said, I believe the truth, that NoSQL is less expensive than SQL. Because I know what our Oracle and our SQL server costs. I have, I'm in charge of the cost analysis for that. So I know exactly how much it costs us for those things. And so then I did an analysis of SQL and MarkLogic and NoSQL to figure out which one's the cheaper. And I was shocked. This blew me away. And the reason why, that exadata, which has, you know, usually priced in the millions, um, is cheaper. It's because the appliance allows you to get economy of scale and performance that you can't get by building yourself. It shocked me. I still, every time I say it, I go, I cannot believe this. I know the price tag on that thing, but I run the numbers and the cost per gigabyte, and that's actually easy to calculate because I know what it costs us and how many gigabytes are on that that are usable, um, is cheaper. And then I run the cost analysis for all the others, and our SQL Server and Oracle databases are medium cost. MarkLogic is a medium cost. NoSQL is high. Why? Because NoSQL redundancy is, is, is server level. So if I want to be redundant in Mongo, I have to have three servers with the same data on it, which means I've tripled my data size. 
If I triple my data size, I have three times the SAN storage. SAN storage is very expensive. We pay $5 a gigabyte for our high-end, highly available EMC VMAX storage. Um, that's not the exact price we pay to the vendor. That's the price that our storage team charges to us, which is marked up somewhat. But, so I don't want to give them possible prices, but that's the price my team pays for storage for VMAX high available storage. And that storage is decent storage, but it's already redundant. NoSQL assumes you have local disks that aren't redundant and it's cheap. Yeah, I can go to Walmart and buy a $50 terabyte disk, and that'd be great for NoSQL, but you, don't, you can't do that in an enterprise data center. They won't let me stick a Walmart disk in there. <laughs> You know, they want me to stick a server, my cheap Dell server that's really reliable and that runs my whole entertainment system. I pay 300 bucks for it. They won't let me stick that in the data center for NoSQL. They make me go on expensive blades. Why? Because of power and space. And, and then they assume the old paradigm. So I can't use cheap stuff. So NoSQL turns out to be way more expensive. Plus, by the way, no, open source is not free. I look at the pricing models, and some of the vendors are extremely expensive, more expensive than Oracle. So that everybody thought, oh, it's free, it's open source, you actually price it out. Because, by the way, if you're making redundancy across multiple servers, you're buying more servers, which is more licenses, and more support costs. So I actually priced it out, and I was shocked. I, I really didn't expect that, so I thought it would be cheaper. I, but yeah, and that's also, I broke it out by price per gigabyte versus price per transaction. It's not so bad, because no single is very fast on the transactions. It keeps the price low per transaction. So that's an important consideration. Are you looking for volume or velocity? If you're looking for volume, you, um, NoSQL is not going to be the cheapest solution. Is development faster? Well, it is a Mark Logic. We've proven that. We have 50 apps written in it, and it is about twice as fast to develop an app in Mark Logic versus Java or .NET. Um, but it's not true for most of the other NoSQL solutions because they're not asset compliant, and so they have to write all this code to compensate. And the other thing is, like we talked to, like Cassandra, all the key value store vendors, that includes Oracle's NoSQL, Cassandra, React, all the, all the key value ones, HBase, um, et cetera, they all require you to store data multiple times if you want to query it in multiple ways. If I want to query it by date, I have to have a date key. If I want to query it by person, I'll better store it again, order by person. If I have it by geographic location, I'll better store it again, order by geographic location, because they can't search inside the documents efficiently to get you the results you want quickly. So you have, so their answer, when we ask these questions, they answer, well, yeah, just store it multiple times. Store the same data, sort it different ways by different keys, um, you're wasting disk space, ups your cost. And then, the, and since they, have, they aren't asset compliant, if you have a problem writing it in all those places and it fails, it comes back and says, well, I got it to some of them. We're good, right? It's done. And you go, well, no, what are, I gotta have it in all these places. So my queries return the same results, whether I'm sorting by date or person or location or whatever, and you don't have any way to guarantee it got there. And so it's not a trivial thing, and they make it out like it is. If you have a trivial app, it may be trivial, but it's not. And then, so the answer is, Mark Logic is absolutely ready for, for the enterprise. We've proven that. We bought it four years ago. It's proven enterprise worthy. We did spend a lot of money to bring it in and integrate it for enterprise. It's something to, to consider. You bring in a NoSQL solution, you're going to spend 100 to a million dollars, 100,000 to a million, to get it integrated into your environment, to get engineers assigned to it, to support it. That's a cost all by itself. Um, but also, the thing is, the no, other NoSQL solutions are like version one, version two. And we talk about basic things like security. Do you have security on your database? No. Do you have a password to protect your database? Well, some do, some don't. You don't have a password? So a hacker just breaks through my, my, my enterprise firewall, which they do all the time, by the way. No one is secure from hackers getting through your firewalls. They, every company is vulnerable to that. They get through ours all the time. They have intrusion detection. They get in there, and there's no password to your data? You, there's no secondary level of defense? No. Your apps are supposed to do that. You can do local firewall on your, on your database. I mean, they, the level of maturity there is very immature because it's in its startups. And it's, it's a good fit. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be crit critical. It's just they're not thinking about the enterprise. MarkLogic, for example, was built from the beginning for the enterprise. That's their customers were big published companies in the government. And they wanted, they had enterprise needs. So they built an enterprise system. Notice the other NoSQL are built for internet startups. So those needs are very different. And so if you're doing the internet startup, NoSQL's great. Um, but I'm talking about enterprises. Will it be mainstream? Yeah, I think in a couple of years, a year, five years, more and more of these other NoSQL solutions will become enterprise ready. There's a big money in the enterprise. Enterprise pay lots of money for this stuff. Um, Mark Lodge is already there, but it is still in the hype phase. Gartner puts it smack dab in the hype phase. Um, Mark Lodge is a little ahead because they've been doing this for five years before everybody else started in the NoSQL space. So, 
And end result is my recommendation is that Enterprise needs no SQL for these reasons I list. And those are real legitimate reasons. And that's why the LDS Church bought MarkLogic to do those things. Um, and MarkLogic is ready. It's the only one that's fully ready today for the Enterprise. Um, and the other NoSQL solutions will be there eventually. And by the way, um, I'm not, I, I really feel bad that I found like a MarkLogic commercial, but it's just the reality of the analysis. And I, and I really honestly forgot about MarkLogic for that whole year. It was bizarre. I, I, think, I look back and I think, what's wrong with me? Um, and when, but when I came back and I said, well, duh, because <laughs> it just was a different paradigm, right? I wasn't thinking of MarkLogic because NoSQL just didn't even come together in my mind. And when I did, it was a perfect fit. So we're, we, we, we have a long term relationship with MarkLogic, and I'm not explaining because we just chose to because of this analysis. So that's it.